All right, well, let's get started. Um, I made this uh, statement last night to the general class. I said, I think we'll get out of here early. And we went the complete two hours. And so, uh, but I think we'll get out of here early tonight. Uh, so uh, yeah, knock on something. Um, let me just uh, give you a little report. The, the video you saw uh, earlier and uh, some of the sounds, that was from the contest this last weekend. It's the big contest, CQ Worldwide Single Sideband, uh, and it's a worldwide contest with the amateurs from all the countries in the world. And um, so I look forward to it every year. And uh, so I started, uh, it's a 48-hour contest. Uh, starts uh, at midnight Greenwich Mean Time on Saturday, uh, which is 8 p.m. Friday, our time. And uh, it goes for 48 hours. Well, I didn't operate all 48 hours. I operated 29 of the 48 hours. Wow. And um, so it was a lot of fun. Uh, I had some issues um, that I had to work through, but this was my result. Uh, and this is from a, a website you might find interesting called 3830 Scores, um, which actually keeps track of the contests and, and you get uh, reports and, and comments from people. So this is my claimed score. After 29 hours of operation, I'd made 628 contacts uh, with a point uh, score of 501,700, which puts me right in the middle, actually. Um, it's about the same scores that I've had in the past two. So in order to up my game, I've got to come up with some tricks and some strategies. And my first strategy is I'm going to ask my friend Matt, who is a German ham, DJ8OG, who is actually coming to live here in the Greenville Spartanburg area, fingers crossed. Uh, he'll be here for three years, so you may get a chance to meet him. Anyway, this was my score, 628 contacts, 500,000 points. This is Matt's score. He operated for only 24 hours. And he didn't use computer spotting. He ran in the classic mode of just finding contacts and, and working them or calling CQ and having them call. He worked 2,081 contacts and 1,838,000 points. So there's a world-class contester. And he's coming to this area. So um, if you want to know more about contesting, he would be a good resource. And I'm going to pump him for all I can. <laughs> so. Um, Here's the, uh, the website for, the, for the, uh, the contest if you wanted to for, find out more information about this one. Uh, and then upcoming contests, the American Radio Relay League uh, has a contest calendar. Uh, and so you can look there and see what contests might be coming up. It's a lot of fun. Uh, and um, it's kind of like playing video games, uh, but on a real world basis. So <laughs> I, I tell you how much I love this hobby and how Wonderful things just kind of happen in this hobby. And remember last week we were talking about call signs. And I mentioned my wife who you know, got her t uh, license uh, by studying online. And then she got this call sign that she could never remember. And we found that K4SAB was available. And so we applied for it under the vanity program. And she got it. So that's, that's her call sign. So two days ago. A letter comes in the mail addressed to my wife from a ham. There's a ham call. And I said, oh, you're getting uh, mail from ham radio operators. She goes, what? I don't even make any contacts. I don't get on the air. What, what would I be getting, you know? And so inside the envelope was a very nice letter and a QSL card. I'm going to put the glasses on. Letter from Carol Rafferty. Her call is K4SAF. And I won't read the letter, but um, in it, she says, my father 
was K4SAB. And she looked up the call and found it had been issued. And she said, I thought you might like to have one of his old QSL cards. So it just, it, you know, sent chills up and down, you know, both of our spines that, wow, that someone would take the time and trouble to reach out, to say hello, uh, and to send this on. This card is from the 1960s. You can tell that because on the date field, it's printed 196. And you fill in the last number. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Carol, as I said in the general class last night, and I'll uh, say again tonight, thank you so much for reaching out to, to Sabina. She's writing you back, and we really appreciate it, and God bless you. Thanks. So wanted to share that with you. So tonight we're back on regulations, but these are operating regulations. Uh, any questions of, from uh, any of the material that we've covered so far? You're well over the hump. You've come a long way, and whether you realize it or not, um, that you've absorbed a lot of knowledge and information. Uh, and so just keep, keep it up, you're doing great. So if you read in the chapter, you might already realize this, that um, every station, uh, when they're transmitting, must have a control operator. And generally, it's the station licensee, the person who has uh, the, the license. Uh, for, the, for the station, that's what the assumption is. But you can actually designate someone else to be the control operator of your station. Let's say you get your technician license, but you invite me over, uh, and you have a, a high frequency radio, but you don't really have any privileges on the high frequency bands, but you want to test it out, we'll say, Gary, can you operate? So you can designate me as the control operator for your station, now I'll use my call sign, and I can operate with your station uh, using my privileges. Because it's the privileges of the control operator that set the parameters of what's okay and, and what's not. Um, control operators must be licensed US amateur radio operators, or can be a foreign uh, licensed amateur radio operator if there is a reciprocal operating agreement between our two countries. Get out the glasses, this is the fine print here. So the person responsible for station operations when the station is transmitting is deemed to be the control operator. The control operator must prevent harmful interference, uh, that which seriously degrades, obstructs, or repeatedly interrupts a radio communication service, so that's harmful interference. Uh, the control operator, as I mentioned, is designated by the station licensee. It's assumed to be the station licensee, unless there's a, a record kept that, that that's not the case. And the control operator's class of license sets the operating conditions. What frequencies and bands can you operate on? And there is a shared responsibility between the station licensee and the control operator. So if the station licensee knows, for example, that they have an amplifier that has a bad output section and generates harmonic uh, outputs on other frequencies, but he designates a control op, or he or she designates a control operator uh, and, and causes harmful interference, well, you, they're both responsible for, for that. And one thing that people don't think about, but repeaters, radio repeaters, have a control operator. It's just that the control operator may not be on site. They may not be at the, the radio repeater location. And I'll tell you why here in a, in a little bit. So when can a station transmit without a control operator? Never. Never. Always got to have one. When can a station receive without a control operator? Anytime. Receive is no problem, but transmit, that's where the control operator comes in. So can a technician class licensee be named the control operator of an extra class station and then proceed to operate in the extra class portion of the band? No. no. That is correct. If you came to my station, uh, I couldn't designate you as the control operator. However, I could retain control operator status and have you sit down at my station and using my call sign, operate on the high frequency bands as a demonstration. Uh, and that's allowed as long as I'm right there uh, to prevent harmful interference. And 
this is kind of a theoretical thing, but it's kind of obvious. The control point for a transmitting station is the location at which the control operator function is performed. Okay, I'll sit down behind my radio, I tune the big knob. Well, that's the control point. But what if I remotely control my station with my smartphone? This is now the control point. Uh, so the control point is where the control function actually takes place. Let's answer some questions. So when is an amateur station permitted to transmit without a control operator? Never. never. Receive, OK. Transmit, never. And who must designate the station control operator? The station, station licensee, yes, indeed. And what determines the transmitting privileges of an amateur station? C. D. D. Oh. The class of operator license held by the designated control operator. Yes, indeed. And what is an amateur station control point? The location at which the control operator function is performed, whether it be behind the big knob or behind the smartphone. Either one could be the control point. And when, under normal circumstances, may a technician class licensee be the control operator of a station operating, operating in an exclusive amateur extra class segment of the amateur bands? When can they be the control operator? At no time. Because remember, the control operator sets the, you know, where you can go in the bands. And if they're technicians, they can't be the control operator and operate in the extra class portion, portion of the bands. Now, if I retain uh, the control operator status, then maybe. So when the control operator is not the station licensee, who is responsible for the proper operation of the station? You share. Share responsibility. And who does the FCC presume to be the control operator? The station licensee. No formulas in this chapter. <laughs> so identification, we're talking about station identification here. Um, the rule is every 10 minutes, after every 10 minutes, and at the end of your transmission at the end of the contact. At the beginning of a contact? No. There is no requirement. It's after every 10 minutes and at the end of a contact. And you have to identify in English or Morse code. Morse code is always allowed. So if you're doing a radio teletype transmission at the end, you ID in Morse code, that's OK. On uh, FM on the repeater, you could theoretically ID with Morse code. That's perfectly fine. In fact, some radios have automatic ID functions that you can push a button and it'll do that. So um, must you ID for just a brief test transmission? Yes. Yes. After every transmission, that's the rule. Um, now, you might be doing some test uh, transmissions and within a 10 minute period of time, then you have to put an ID out, and then when you conclude, you have to identify. So you can have some brief transmissions and then identify after that. There is an exception. You like this radio control model? I thought that was awesome. A lot of hams are, are into radio control, and one thing is that with an amateur license, you can go at higher power levels. But it's impractical to transmit your station call sign using a remote control. Um, so that's the exception. What you actually have to do is you have to um, print your call sign and paste it on the uh, control uh, transmitter along with your name and your address. And that constitutes identification. So this is uh, an exception. Sometimes if you're assisting in um, public events, let's say maybe a marathon, um, and you know, 
a lot of these groups will contact amateur radio clubs and say, hey, can you provide communications for us? And so there'll be you know, stations designated maybe at the starting line or at the midway point uh, at, the, at the end. Well, you can use something called tactical call signs because you don't know exactly who the operator is that's assigned at the starting line. Uh, it might be Tom, it might be Ricky, don't know. So you can say, starting line, starting line, uh, here is midway point. That's perfectly OK, as long as after every 10 minutes or at, and at the end of your transmission, you use also your amateur radio call sign. This is midway point clear, whiskey for echo, echo, Yankee. So 10 minutes and at the end of a transmission. This is a recurring theme. Uh, Morse code uh, is, we mentioned, always good for an uh, ID. And the phonetic alphabet is also encouraged by the FCC. The reason being is, let's say the FCC had an official monitor that was trying to track down a problem. Well, they want to be able to you know, hear your call sign clearly so they can rule you out as you know, not being you know, who they're looking for. So a phonetic alphabet and, and Morse code are always good. Um, you can have, if you're operating from another region in the United States, um, you can, in this case, this uh, is one of my old call signs, Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee uh, from Michigan. Uh, and, but if I came down here and I wanted to indicate I was operating from Foreland, from uh, South Carolina, I could say Whiskey 8 Echo Echo Yankee Stroke 4, or Stroke Whiskey 4. Um, that, forward slash in the computer world is called either a slant, a stroke, or a slash. You'll hear all three of those. And it doesn't matter which one you use. They're all fine. I think this is the weirdest rule, but I've got to cover it. There's also something called a self-assigned call sign indicator. I could say whiskey eight stroke, or whiskey eight echo echo Yankee stroke delighted. It sounds silly to me, but you can do it. Maybe it's better on, on Morse code. The only thing is you cannot um, use certain um, uh, FCC, uh, FCC designators uh, like AG, uh, which is for acting general if you upgrade, or um, any of the international prefixes like DL. That's for Germany. So there are certain things you can't do. That's called a self-assigned call sign indicator. Just be aware of it. I've never heard one on the air. I mentioned upgrades. Um, when you go for your uh, amateur radio license uh, and get your technician license, then you're going to be looking forward, I hope, uh, to going on further and getting your general license. And so when you move from technician to general, that's called an upgrade. And if you, when you pass your test for the general, you are a general at that instant. Uh, they will give you a certificate of successful completion of exam, and you can go out immediately and operate on the general class portions of the amateur radio bands using your technician call sign. However, you have to do this. For example, I'm going to pick on you, Ricky. Uh, KN4KRU stroke AG or slash AG or slant AG. I think it stands for acting general. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> anyway, um, and so from novice to technician, it's slash KT. From technician to general, slash AE. And from general to extra, it's slash AE. But you don't have to wait. Uh, now, when your upgrade appears in the FCC database, which is usually just a few days later, then you can stop doing that. Um, and if you're in the technician por portion of the band, like operating in a repeater, you don't have to do it, unless you want to brag. More questions? So what are the FCC rules regarding the use of a phonetic alphabet for station identification? Encouraged. It is encouraged. And when may an amateur station transmit without on-the-air identifications? Look at D there, the model aircraft. Yep, that's the one exception. 
And when using technical identifiers, such as race headquarters, how often must your station transmit the station's FCC assigned call sign? How often? Every 10 minutes and at the end of the transmission. That never changes. And when is an amateur station required to transmit its assigned call sign? 10 minutes and at the end of a transmission. And I have to say, since I've been teaching the classes and I have students who monitor me on the air now, I've had to get much better at identifying myself. So which of the following is an acceptable language to use for station identification? English. And what method of call sign identification is required for a station transmitting phone signals? C CW or phone? Yeah, you, you caught it. You can use you know, Whiskey 4, Echo, Echo, Yankee into your microphone or Morse code, CW. And which of the following formats of a self-assigned indicator is acceptable? What they're trying to teach you here is stroke, slant, slash, they're all okay, all of the above. And which of the following is required when making on the air test transmissions? I like notify the FCC. No. You have to identify when you're making test transmissions after 10 minutes and at the end. All right, interference. Gary, I have a question. Sure. When you're, when you're doing test transmissions, you let them know that it's a test at the beginning, right? Um, you can. Um, first, you want to find a clear frequency where you're not interfering with any ongoing communications. You may then ask, is the frequency in use? And if you don't hear anything come back, okay, then you can start doing your, your, your transmission. Maybe you're tuning up a, an amplifier or something else. And then at the end, when you're done, you say, uh, this is Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee now concluding test transmission. So you wouldn't do this on a call frequency, right? No, please. <laughs> well, I mean, just to try to get somebody to tell you it sounds okay. Well, now that's called a radio check. And so that's, that's different. Um, so yeah, if, you, if you're looking to have somebody come back to you to tell you about the quality of your, or your signal, uh, you just go on the frequency you think somebody might be there, either the repeater or uh, a calling frequency and say, hey, Whiskey 4 Echo Echo Yankee, anyone around for a radio check, please? And hopefully somebody will come back. Okay, interference is defined as that which seriously degrades, obstructs, or interrupts uh, radio communications service, or another licensed service uh, that is operating in accordance with the regulations. We are an amateur radio, uh, the amateur radio is a radio service. So if an unlicensed device interferes with us, that's interference to us that we can actually get the FCC's help in eliminating. There's two kinds of interference though. Interference to you and interference from you. So you always got to be aware of, of, of that. And the most important thing, and you can understand why, is we want to avoid interfering with radio navigation and location services. Um, you don't want your transmissions to you know, make an aircraft come out of the sky. That would be a bad thing. Um, so um, here are some frequency ranges in which uh, aircraft or other navigation systems utilize. They're all over the place. So just be aware uh, that they're there and, and do your best to not interfere uh, with any of these particular services, either for aircraft communications or navigation, for example. All right, I always hate to bring this up, but I have to. Um, it's an unfortunate uh, fact that um, in any hobby, including ours, there are children who never grew up. And on some of the ham bands, well, I don't like the sound of your signal, so I'm going to harass you, you know, with QRM, man-made interference, or in this case, DQRM, deliberate man-made interference. 
Um, it goes on uh, when there's a big de-expedition from a rare country uh, coming on and, and a ham who maybe has had difficulty in working uh, that rare country. Here's other hams working that country. And he says, well, I'll show you. I'll tune up on the DX frequency, and I'll just cause all sorts of interference. That's deliberate QRM. Um, it's never legal, but it does exist. So it's never OK. Oh, and then you'll hear that the old timers, I have to watch when I say that, because I'm an old timer now. But somebody, I've always met on this frequency at this time with my buddies. This is my frequency. No. No one owns a particular frequency. And the nice thing about amateur radio is we have that big knob. We can QSY to another frequency. Um, but still, you'll hear people if you come up, and even if you ask, is the frequency in use? And, and then you start calling CQ, and then they'll come back, hey, we were here. It's best not to get into an on-air argument. Just QSY, move off. Nobody wins. Nobody wins if you argue on the air. So The rule is that common sense and courtesy should prevail. So with, with my question is, with all these nets that go on, mm -hmm. and you're not going to know, especially someone like us, is not going right. to include where any of this stuff right. is. Um, so you could potentially be trying to use something, and five minutes they're going to have yes. some kind of a net. Yes. They'll, they'll tell you all this and yes. ask you to leave. Yeah, hopefully they'll, in a courteous manner, come on frequency and say, um, you know, call you by call sign and say, hey, um, we have a regular net that meets here um, coming up in about uh, a minute. Uh, could I ask you to QSY down uh, you know, five kilohertz? Uh, and that's fine. That's great. That's no problem. Um, but there are other instances where you know, it doesn't go so well. So just you know, use common sense and courtesy. Oh, more questions. When is it? Uh, when is willful interference to other amateur radio stations permitted? Never. Never, at no time. And which of the following applies when two stations transmitting on the same frequency interfere with each other? Courtesy. Courtesy should prevail. No one has a right to a particular frequency. All right, let's take five minutes. I told you we're going to go home early tonight. All right, let's start with section 8.4, third party communications. Um, proceed with caution if somebody asks you to send a message to somebody else in another country. That's a third party. And you can only do that if that country has an agreement with the United States. And there's a, a, a URL here in the middle of the, at the American Radio Relay League which has the current list of countries that we have third party agreements with. And as Veronique was saying, it's surprising. France isn't on that list. Germany isn't on that list. Um, so you need to be careful before you, you know, do that. Um, I mentioned Matt, you know, the, the contester. Um, I actually worked him in the Worked All Europe contest uh, a few weeks ago. And at the end, um, maybe I mentioned, he said, oh, say hi to Sabina for me. That was third party traffic. And technically, it was not right. But anyway, uh, probably not you know, so important. But um, be careful. The rules are that you can only pass third party traffic if there's an agreement that says you can do it. Would that be third party since she's licensed? Well, she, but she wasn't um, uh, on the air with me. Yeah, so yes, yeah, I think so. Third party traffic is only allowed by the governments of the countries involved. If it's, if it's allowed by the countries involved, then, then you can have third party traffic. OK, I put this slide up just for the cartoon. Well, I've got third party insurance, but I've only been to two. Oh. Questions? Told you we're going home. Which of the following restrictions apply 
when a non-licensed person is allowed to speak to a foreign station using a station under the control of a technician class control operator. L long question, but what they're asking about is this unlicensed person is talking on the radio. That unlicensed person is a third party. And so the foreign station must be one with which the US has a third party agreement. And to which foreign stations do the FCC rules authorize the transmission of non-emergency third-party communications? Any station whose government permits it, and only those. And what is meant by the term third-party communications? A message from a control operator to another amateur station on behalf of a third party or another person. Remote and automatic operation. Yeah. I got a question. What about phone patches? Um, well, phone patches were generally um, for military, uh, and, and so. Uh, I'm thinking about Vietnam, where a lot of calls went back to the states, uh, and those uh, were were authorized. Vietnam had, a, yeah. Yeah, I did a lot of phone patching mm -hmm. in the uh, '90s with a missionary down right. in Bogota. Right, and yes, that would be third-party traffic. So theoretically, there should have been, uh, you know, uh, an agreement between the countries. Yep. So automatic control. Think of repeaters. As I mentioned, all repeaters have a control operator, but the control operator may not be at the repeater site. The Caesar's head repeater is up really high on a mountaintop, uh, and there's not anyone there all the time. Uh, so what automatic control does uh, is it uses devices, controllers, and procedures that ensure compliance with FCC ro rules. So you see at the bottom that little photo there, that's a repeater controller uh, with software inside that monitors the repeater and, and doesn't let the repeater be locked into transmit all the time. In fact, if you listen to the repeater, um, it, it's kind of a point of shame if you go on and talk so long. I think the repeater timeout on this repeater is I don't know, five minutes, 10 minutes, I don't know. I think it's 10. 10, I think it's 10, but you'll hear it occasionally. Somebody will go on and on and on and on with their story, and then you'll hear this robotic voice come on, repeater time out, and then the repeater goes off the air. That's the automatic control thinking that there's something wrong, and, and the repeater shouldn't be on this long, so after a period of time that it'll reset, repeater, time out, restored, and then back to normal. So then all their buddies say, hey, Tom, you, uh, you uh, timed out the repeater. <laughs> but repeaters and digipeaters use automatic control, uh, automated controllers that uh, minimize or inhibit interference. Um, the repeaters still have a control operator, but they may be off-site. Now, that's different from remote control. And this is one setup using something called remote rig. A lot of radio sets have removable front panels. And what they've been able to do is have the radio and an antenna at one location, connect a box up to the internet, uh, and then take the front panel of the radio and connect it up to the internet, and you can operate remotely. Um, I'm, I'll send you a link to a beautiful video uh, done by a, a ham from Canada, Pascual uh, Villanueva, called the uh, uh, Technician and the DXer. I think that's the title. Sorry, Pascal. Um, it, it's just a guy who loved ham radio, but because he relocated, he could never do ham radio anymore. And through remote control, they were able to get him back on the air. And it's really kind of touching. So I'll send you a link to that. So this is remote control using the remote rig system. This is my radio. This is a Flex 6600. And they market it as a radio server. It's connected to the internet. 
And from this laptop computer, I can log into my station up by Table Rock, turn on the equipment up there, and begin operating. Uh, and I do that from my house here in town. So it, operating your station um, over the internet uh, is uh, probably the, the typical uh, example now of remote control. Now, if I was operating uh, from the laptop here uh, under remote control, where would the control point be? Here. Right here, exactly. Control point is the location where the control function takes place. So through a radio repeater, let's say somebody gets on the repeater and uses bad language or some other um, offense uh, that uh, the FCC could cite. Is the repeater operator responsible? The rule is no. It's the originating station, the person who transmitted through the repeater. They're responsible for their conduct. And so the repeater owner is, is not held liable. Oh, questions. So which of the following is an example of automatic control? Re automatic control. Repeater operation. It uses devices and procedures to make sure that you comply with FCC rules. All right, which of the following is true of remote control operation? Every one of those, indeed. And, and operating remotely is called indirect manipulation of the controls. So, yeah. And which of the following is, is an example of remote control as defined in Part 97 rules? Operating the station over the internet, like I do. That's yeah, remote control. And who is accountable should a repeater inadvertently retransmit communications that violate the FCC rules? The originating station. Yep. All right, prohibited transmissions. Normally you cannot you know, talk to another radio service, you know, you can talk to amateur radio operators, but you normally you can't talk to police, you can't talk to fire, unless there's the exemption, emergency situation where there's danger to, to life or personal property. However, there is a unique day where you can talk to the military. It's called Armed Forces Day. Uh, it's the third Saturday in May, and you will listen on frequencies that will be published that the military will transmit on, um, and you transmit on amateur radio frequencies where they will listen. So this is an exemption uh, to the prohibition of not talking to other services. Um, tonight, Wednesday night, where the, when the net comes on the Caesar's Head repeater at 9 o'clock, they'll do the normal check-ins, and then they have a regular Wednesday night swap and shop where people will list amateur radio equipment for sale or say, hey, I'm looking for such and such or so and so. This is a holdover. This is before the internet. This was, this was a way that a lot of people bought and sold amateur radio equipment. So it's kind of neat to see this tradition carry on. Um, that's OK, as long as the equipment uh, is uh, actually amateur radio equipment, uh, and it's done on an, an irregular basis that it's not a business that, that's coming on um, that's, that's selling things. So that's, that's OK. Obscenity is prohibited. And even mild prof uh, profanity is, is, is you know, discouraged. So it's more than George Carlin's seven words. Just use common sense and, and watch your language. Retransmission of other uh, stations, either commercial service stations or even another amateur station, is prohibited except for these exemptions, space stations, auxiliary stations, which are remote receivers for repeaters, and repeaters. Of course, those, they can repeat um, other transmissions. And you cannot operate your radio equipment for money. 
The only exemption is, uh, I like to say, think of a high school uh, physics teacher who has a ham radio station in their classroom. Well, he's getting paid by the school system, but he's not using the, the ham radio equipment for, for monetary purposes. It's just incidental to the classroom training. Music. Transmission is prohibited except when incidental to manned spacecraft activities. You have to be older than a lot of folks in this room. I remember you know, the Mercury space program, and then Gemini, and then Apollo. And when the astronauts were up in space, NASA used to um, wake up the astronauts with music. They'd play music on the radio channel. And NASA gave amateur radio operators in, in certain locations the rights to rebroadcast NASA mission control. So you could, on your ham receiver, listen to the NASA mission as it was going on live. But sometimes they'd put music on. So this was the exemption. Not so often anymore, but the, that's still in the books. Also, codes and ciphers. You cannot uh, transmit using uh, scrambled speech or using uh, even a voice code that only you and your buddy know. Anything that obscures the meaning of a message is prohibited, except if you're controlling radio-controlled aircraft or drones, or if you're controlling a satellite in space. Then those may be encrypted uh, because you don't want anyone else inadvertently or purposefully taking over control uh, of those craft. So that's the exception. News gathering. Your amateur radio station cannot be used for news gathering except in the case of an emergency uh, where there's danger to life or, or property. And broadcasting. Broadcasting is defined by the FCC as transmitting to the general public. You can't do that except if you're doing Morse code practice transmissions or information bulletins dealing with amateur radio, or emergency communications. W1AW, this is uh, the American Radio Relay League station in Newington, Connecticut. That's the, the building that the station is housed in. Uh, every night they have Morse code practice transmissions that come from uh, this facility. So that's allowed under this rule. And amateur radio is not a substitute for commercial communications channels. You can't make regular transmissions when other means are available. Now, back in the day, missionaries way out in the, you know, the, the jungle or whatnot had no other means available. So um, I was stationed in Liberia. Uh, and uh, I know that a number of the American families there at Elwa and some others uh, used amateur radio to, to keep in touch back home because the post and telecommunications was not reliable at all. All right. I think these are the last questions. Under which of the following circumstances may an amateur radio station make one-way transmissions? Think of W1AW and their code transmissions um, when you're doing that, or information bulletins, or emergency communications. Then you can do that. And when is it permissible to transmit messages encoded to hide their meaning? Only when transmitting control commands to radio control or space stations. And under what conditions is an amateur station authorized to transmit music? When incidental to a manned spacecraft uh, uh, retransmission authorized by NASA. And when may amateur radio operators use their stations to notify other amateurs of the availability of equipment for sale? I call this the swap and shop rule. Yes, when it's equipment that's normally used in an amateur station and when it's not done on a regular or business basis. And what, if any, are the restrictions concerning transmission of language that may be considered indecent or obscene? Not allowed, prohibited. And what types of amateur stations can automatically retransmit the signals of other stations? Repeaters, 
auxiliary stations, which are remote receivers for repeaters, and space stations. Yeah. And in which of the following circumstances may the control operator of an amateur station receive compensation for operating that station? Incidental to classroom instruction at an educational institution. And under which of the following circumstances are amateur stations authorized to transmit signals related to broadcasting, program production, news gathering, assuming no other means are available? This is the under emergency situations um, where there's uh, safety of human life or the protection of property. And what is the meaning of the term broadcasting? General public, transmitting to the general public. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of chapter eight. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll see you next week. Uh, next week we will be meeting downstairs uh, in, because they're going to be doing some work on the floor in the gymnasium. Uh, and we will have a, the section on safety. Uh, Tom will be presenting that. Then we'll take a break. And then Robert Webster, the president of the Greenville Amateur Radio Society, will be uh, having a special presentation for you. So please come. Thanks. <laughs>